Hi there, Mindsetters. Welcome. It's your boy, Ty, here. Welcome to Mindset Learn Extra. This is grade, 10, tw grade 12 physical science. Tonight's show is brought to you by Liberty. And last week, we covered organic molecules with Philip here. And tonight, we're going to be doing the properties of organic molecules with Philip. And we're going to be taking it. Philip is going to be taking us through. Philip, can you explain a bit more about it? Absolutely, Ty. Okay. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking a look at the difference between physical properties and chemical properties. We're going to start off with some of those physical properties. We've got an experiment. I've got a really nice clip to show you. We're going to be taking a look at that a little bit later. I'm definitely excited about that. So guys, please feel free to just send us those questions. Tweet me. Send me all your questions on facebook.com uh, forward slash learn extra. And tweet me at learn extra. And and guys, if you're having any problems, we will get to you eventually throughout the year because we're going to be going through these lessons. And guys, if you're having any difficult, guys, send those questions in. And next week's topic is going to be organic reactions. Lots of you have been asking about the schedule. So if you are in a group, make sure that you're in, tuned in with us next week because for organic reactions. The show tonight will start with the lessons on properties of organic molecules. Then after the break, we're going to take a look at a couple of examples of Philip here. I'm going to be his wingman. And then lastly, we're going to tackle a couple of the questions of, on the topic. There are lots of ways to get hold of us. So guys, remember, again, Facebook me, tweet me, let me know what you guys are thinking. Uh, it's www.facebook.com forward slash learn extra and tweet me at learn extra. So while you guys are watching, shoot off those questions, let me know and we'll get to them at the third part of the show. And I also, guys, let's not forget, I still have this Casio calculator that I'm be giving away for the best Facebook post. So guys, make sure you post, 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 post. And then after the break, we're going to be back with Philip who's going to be taking us through this. See you guys soon. Welcome back, Mindsetters. It's your boy Ty here with my man Phil. And today we're going to be doing grade 12 physical science. We're going to be going through properties of organic molecules. So guys, make sure you have your notes out, you have your pads out, you guys are taking notes. And guys, don't forget to Facebook, tweet me, and I'll be sending all your questions through to Phil, who's going to be answering them later on in the show. And right now, I'm going to hand over to Phil. Take it away. Thanks so much, Ty. Okay, well, welcome grade 12s. Last week we were talking about organic molecules. We were talking about how to name these things. Gave you guys a really mean challenge question, a lot of debate on the Facebook page, and that's what we want to see. I want to see those answers coming in thick and fast. I hope that you've got a pen or a pencil waiting for the challenge question. You're going to take it down quick, and I want you to discuss it on the page and see who's right. Remember that there's that Casio calculator. We're giving that away. Um, but let's first start taking a look at what we're going to be covering this lesson. Now, one of the things that people actually ask me is what is the difference between a physical property and what is a chemical property? Well, what we've decided to do is I've chosen to split these two lessons in half. Well, this lesson we're going to be talking about physical properties of organic molecules. I've made a list of those physical properties which you can be tested on in exams and they are the boiling point, the melting point, viscosity which is something which you haven't taken a look at and that's a word that not many people are used to and vapor pressure. So I'm going to focus mainly on those first two points. I'm going to talk about the boiling and the melting point of compounds. Then perhaps if we've got a little bit of time, I can actually discuss the idea of why some substances are very thick, like syrup or honey. But we're going to apply this to organic molecules. Why is oil very, very difficult to pour? Why is it not like water? And then finally, if we've got a little bit of time, we're going to talk about vapor pressure. Now, if you're writing down these points, if you're making some points at home, just remember that viscosity is a thickness, while vapor pressure is a substance's desire to become a gas. It's basically the pressure which is given out by that substance to go outwards into a gaseous phase. So there they are. We're going to try and find out why some organic molecules have a high or low melting point, why they are very viscous, perhaps why they have a low or high vapor pressure. I want you to be able to use this language and hopefully map your way through organic molecules and describe why is this organic substance the way that it is. Why is this one a solid? Why is this one a liquid? Perhaps a gas as well. So we're going to keep it quite simple, but before we do that, this is a part of the lesson which I really, really like. I'm going to be talking you through the challenge question. And there it is. Okay, now a challenge question, I'm asking you to arrange three molecules in the order of boiling points. Now I want them in descending order. So you're going to start out with the highest boiling point, then you're going to move your way down. So I'm going to put these on, and hopefully the producer can actually put these on the screen for me. And I want you to see and take these down. I've got a couple of molecules over here. Now what I've done is I've chosen them as being very, very similar size. Now I've got three carbons in each one. 
Um, there are two of these which are isomers. If you're feeling clever, you can go figure out which one those are. And uh, if you're looking for a little bit of practice on last week's work, you can actually go about and name these guys. Now, in the first one, I've got two carbons broken by an oxygen. I've got something going on there. It looks a little bit like an ester. The second one seems to have some hydroxyls, and that's a sign that I've got some alcohols. And then in the last one, I've got three carbons linked up to the end, a carboxyl group or a carboxylate. Now, what's happening over there? That gets me a carboxylic acid. So I've got an ester, I've got an alcohol, and I have a carboxylic acid. The problem is they kind of all look the same. Well, we've got a couple of options. I'm going to get out of the way so that you can see this. Well, my first option is option A, where I'm saying that A has got the largest boiling point of these three, followed by three, which is all the way down there, and then followed by two. Well, we're not sure about that. Okay, B, starting with two, going to one, and then to three, that's option B. Option C says to me that it's two as the highest boiling point, and then three as the next highest, and then one with the lowest boiling point. Well, we're going to see what's going on there. So what I'm doing is I'm going to talk about these in terms of decreasing boiling points, and I want you to do the same. So option D tells me that one has got the highest boiling point, then two, then three. I'm not entirely sure. I'm going to start feeding you some boiling points, and I've already done one of them. I'm going to tell you that this object is boiling at 212 degrees Celsius. The problem is, I've got to be able to figure out, do these other substances boil at higher or lower boiling points? Now, that's quite difficult. Now, how do I actually go about explaining why does this boil easily? Why does this boil in a very difficult manner? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to try to break it down into the two most simple ways of predicting how organic molecules boil. Now, this is something that people really battle with right from grade 10. And if you, grade 10s are watching this, you can learn a little bit of something about some bonding and intermolecular forces. So let's try and figure out what type of forces are bonding together organic molecules. Let's see what's standing in our way before these molecules separate from each other and become a gas. Now, I want you to start thinking microscopic. I want you to start thinking on a small scale because I'm going to show you really blown up microscopic pictures of these molecules. And I want you to be able to do this for yourself. Well, let's start very, very simply. Let's take a look at the most basic organic molecules and let's talk about why they separate from each other or what makes it difficult. Well, these two points are very often answers to exam questions. I know that energy is required to weaken intermolecular forces. Okay, I don't like the certain language that people use. In their exams, they say that bonds are broken. Be very careful. That means that you might be breaking covalent bonds and that your molecules are actually falling apart. That's not true. What we're saying is that we're just weakening intermolecular forces so that molecules themselves can separate from one another. Okay, now the other thing which leads on from there is that my change in force strength, and that's specifically the, the thing that I'm going to focus on today. If I know how strong those forces are, I can figure out what these different properties are. Now, these two points are the basis for everything I'm about to say and some of the examples that I'm going to practice with you in a moment. Well, let's get stuck right into it. Well, I know that all molecules have van der Waals forces. Every single molecule out there has got van der Waals forces. And the way that I figure out which ones are bigger and which ones are smaller is I know that larger molecules have more surface area and they are more difficult to vibrate because they're much heavier. So I just want to highlight a couple of really important points over there. I want to see that people can figure out why intermolecular forces will increase or decrease. Now, these van der Waals forces, I know that larger molecules have more surface area. So that means that they've got more space to stick to the next molecule. So there's more surface area. There it is. And they are more difficult to vibrate because they have a larger mass. So these two things make this molecule much better stuck to the next one. So that means that it's much more difficult to actually yank these molecules away from each other. If you're trying to vibrate them and vibrate them away from each other to become gases, you're going to have to work a lot harder. If they're bigger, they're more difficult to move. So let's see if you're integrating all of this into some knowledge. Let's move along and let's actually see if you can figure out how to predict these two. I've got pentane on the left there. They are very, very similar molecules. I've got C5H12. That's an alkane. 
They are all saturated. And I know this because I've got the ain on the end, if you remember there. That means that they are all single bonds. What about heptane? Well, heptane as well has got that ain at the end. So these two molecules are actually very, very similar. Now what I'm going to tell you is that they've got very, very different boiling points. This particular one, and it's quite difficult to actually picture this without drawing out this molecule. What I've done, and I'm going to take up a little bit of space by doing this, is I actually want to show you what pentane looks like on a really microscopic scale. Then we're going to see what heptane looks like on a microscopic scale, and we're going to see why one has got a higher boiling or melting point than the other. So let's bring up those pictures. Let's see what pentane looks like. And there it is. I can see my five carbons. One, two, three, four, five carbons. These end ones have got their three hydrogens. If you want to count them out, I've got 12 surrounding here. It looks pretty big. But what about heptane? If I start to bring up heptane, it's going to look very similar to this. I've still got single bonds between carbons. The hydrogens are still there. Everything seems to be the same. Well, if you actually draw this out, you'll notice a major, major difference between these two molecules. This one is pretty small. So let's actually start drawing this out. You might want to get an idea for this. If you draw this out at home, you could draw out your 2D structural formula. Now, here's what I want to point out about it. I've got pentane. If you were to draw a nice circle around there, you're actually drawing out the circumference of your molecule. So that's the available area onto which I can stick another pentane. So if I was to take one pentane and another pentane and stick them together, I've got that certain amount of surface area. Now take a look at our friend here, heptane. One of the things that I find is that heptane is way bigger. I've got a huge molecule over here. And one of the things that really strikes me is that the surface area of this one is going to be much, much larger. Now I want you to start thinking, how can I figure out which one's going to be easier to boil, which one's going to be more difficult? Well, it's actually really easy if you've been listening. This one's got a small surface area. It's very tiny. It's easy to vibrate very easy to pull off the next molecule. What about this guy? He's got a very large surface area. Lots of place to stick to another heptane molecule. So if they arrive next to each other, it's very, very easy to stick them to each other and very difficult to break them apart. So let's actually try to predict these molecules' properties. Well, I can immediately see that this one's going to have weaker van der Waals forces. Well, that leads me to believe that I've got my weak forces. That means that I have got a low boiling point. Now I'm going to abbreviate chat. So a boiling point, and what you'll find is that the same thing which governs a boiling point is going to be the same thing as a melting point. So it'll also have a low melting point. Now that's generally a case for all these molecules. If there's a low boiling point, there's generally a low melting point. This molecule, much stronger forces. Let's just make sure that our circle's staying with our heptane there. I see this massive, this huge surface area. And what we're going to do is start listing the properties. Well, if pentane comparatively had a low boiling point and a low melting point, this one obviously must be a high melting and boiling point. Well, that's not too difficult. What about those other properties I was talking about earlier? Now. Some of these things are actually very, very difficult to understand unless you start talking about them in general terms, unless I actually give you some real examples. So something with a high melting point, something with a high boiling point. Now, what does that actually mean? Well, if I've got a high boiling point, chances are this object or this material or this substance will be a liquid or a solid. Now, it's actually really easy to understand this if you take a look at the real boiling points. Pentane over here boils at 35 degrees Celsius. That means that on a hot day, this stuff is going to boil. It's going to become a gas. Now, heptane over here has got a boiling point in excess of 70 degrees. That means that this stuff needs to be heated up to a much higher temperature to become a gas. And this I'll actually find in some petrol. Just imagine if the petrol inside your car was all of a sudden becoming a gas. 
Ty, how's it looking there on the Facebook page? We've got a lot of these questions coming in, the challenge questions, a lot of people are already answering. Um, and Nisa wanted to find out if you could briefly draw um, those molecular structures, because she's a bit lost on how those actually work. Okay. Well, absolutely. Um, I want viewers to be patient. Okay, we are going to answer a lot of your questions, especially towards the end of that show. But since Anisha is talking about this particular structure, and this one's quite difficult to understand. This is not the way that you're used to seeing this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a little bit of space. We're going to draw pentane. We're going to draw heptane. And we're going to see what they look like. Now, this is great practice for any grade 12. If you want to draw these out, practice with us. Practice your carbon bonding. And I think we're going to take a little bit of a short ad break and come back with some more amazing stuff. But before we do that, let's draw out our structures here. OK, so now if I've got pentane, pent meaning five, I've got five carbons. One, two, three, four, and five. I hope you can count. I hope that nursery school paid off. There we go. We've got five carbons over there. And what do we need to do? Each carbon needs four bonds. So if I've got one, two, three, and there we go. If I give each carbon four bonds, I've got lots and lots and lots of hydrogen to fill in there. Okay, now this was pentane. So what do I need to do if I want to make heptane? Well, hept, if you remember from maths, that hept and heptagons talk about something with seven. So this was C5. H, if you count them all out, I've got H12, and that was pentane. Relatively small molecule. Okay, but now here's the monster, here's the big guy. So let's draw that over there, that was pentane. So hept, so you're in it for the long haul here. We've got one, two, three, four, five, keep going, six, and seven carbons. I've got a whole bunch of carbons over here. This is making this molecule huge. So I'm just emphasizing that this big molecule is going to be very difficult to get away from another one of these. If I've got heptane there, if I fill in all my structures there, I hope that all the great tools that have done organic chemistry can draw out heptane. And this is great practice. Lots of hydrogen all over the place. And there it is. If you start to count your carbons, I will find that I've got seven carbons and a whole bunch of hydrogens. If you count them around, if I've got C7 and H, and there's an easy way to calculate this, I take that number, double it and I'm going to find that that's going to make 14 and I add 2. That would be 16. If you don't know how to do that, that's absolutely fine. I've just taken a shortcut there. Other way you can do, you can actually go and do your work and count the hydrogens around there. But I think it's around about time for a break. Yes. So guys, again, Facebook me, tweet me, let me know what you guys are thinking. If you have any issues or any problems that you're not really grasping, I'll do my best to get those questions to Phil who will help you out. So guys, again, keep messaging me, facebook.com forward slash learn extra and on Twitter at learn extra. And guys, stay tuned. We've got more questions coming up and it's going to be helping you, out, you guys out. So guys, stay tuned. Welcome back, Mindsetters. We're doing grade 12, physical science, and Phil is going to got some pretty exciting stuff happening there. I'm going to keep my distance because I have long hair and I'm not trying to get caught on light. Um, so I'm actually going to hand over to Phil, and he's going to show us what he has going on there. Absolutely. Thank you, Ty. OK, what I'm going to be showing you is how these things actually come about. How do we find the boiling point of these things? Now, this is going to be a little bit of a safety lesson. You'll see that I'm wearing my safety goggles here. And I've got this really amazing white coat okay, that you see all those crazy professors talking about and wearing. OK, what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to show you a safe way of finding out the boiling point of this stuff. This is methanol. One of the very big problems with methanol and a lot of organic compounds is that this stuff is actually very, very flammable. Now you'll notice, not too far away, I've actually got a flame going. And that's why I've got this lid on here. The problem with this flame is that if I start to boil alcohol, you're going to make all this gaseous alcohol around here. We're going to have a big old fire inside the studio, and that's just not safe. Okay? So I'm not looking to explode anything. I really like living and I'd like to continue doing it as long as possible. So I'm going to show you one of the safest ways to find out the boiling point of something which boils at below 100 degrees. Now you might ask why specifically 100 degrees? Well, I've got this beaker on top of here and that's got some water inside here. I'm just going to show you that it's boiling water and we can actually follow the temperature as we go. 
I'm just going to rest that inside there and hopefully show you what's going on there. I can see that the temperature is rising very, very nicely. If I place anything inside here, which has got, you know, any, anywhere from 50 all the way up to 100, this is a great way of testing out a boiling point. But one of the things that I'm going to do is I'm going to use the water to find the boiling point and not the flame. Flame and alcohol and organic molecules, they love to ask you in final exams, why do I not mix the two? Well, you're going to get a big explosion and a massive fire. I don't want that. My producer doesn't want that. I know the tie doesn't want that. Okay, and uh, you know, we're going to keep his hair long and we're going to keep you guys safe and myself as well. I've still got a lesson to teach. Okay, so I've got this hot water. It's slowly boiling and I'm getting it up to temperature. So I'm getting a hot water bath. Now, if you guys are designing experiments, a hot water bath is a very, very nice way to heat things safely without using a direct flame. Okay, what you can find is that I can see my water is starting to boil there. We're approaching 100 degrees and I'm going to use this methanol not inside this open container. I'm not going to boil this entire thing. What I'm going to do is use a very small amount. I don't need very much to figure out how hot it takes to get me to a boiling methanol test tube. Okay, now I've got this test tube over here. I'm going to place some methanol inside it and we're going to safely boil this. But one of the things that I want to emphasize alcohol and open flames not a good idea so the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm actually going to switch off and there we go we've still got hot water there it is I've got my hot water bath now what I'm going to do is my hot water bath is nice and warm it's around about 92 93 degrees water boils at 96 degrees here on the high felt and I'm going to leave the flame out of this I cannot use an open flame with alcohol so let's find out what temperature methanol boils at and let's do this safely together. I'm going to take a little bit of methanol. We're going to pour it inside the test tube. We don't need a large amount. There it is. I've got a very, very tiny amount of this methanol and now here's the trick. I'm going to place my thermometer inside my methanol and we're going to leave that to heat inside there. Now what I'm hoping for is that I'm going to see that the temperature is going to increase inside the methanol and it's going to take a little while for, because I've got to conduct from hot water on the outside. I can see it's rising there. It's going from 50 all the way up through to 60. I don't know if you can see this at home, but I've got a temperature which is now approaching the lower 60s and it's going up and up and up. And now I hope that you can see at home that my methanol down there at the bottom is actually boiling. If you take a look at that bottom of that test tube, I can actually see that there are bubbles. I'm creating methanol gas. Now what I do is I measure off my temperature here and I see that my temperature is just, just, just below 65 degrees. I can see that I've got hot methanol here and there are my bubbles. I'm hoping that the camera can actually see that. I can see that I've got my hot methanol bubbles being created. Absolutely fantastic and what I'm finding is that the temperature is staying stable at 65 degrees. Now this is one of the safer ways of testing a boiling point of an organic material. No open flames, I'm wearing the lab coat, I've got the safety goggles, Ty is still alive and I'm very happy about that and so am I, okay? But definitely this stuff and alcohols definitely do not mix. These are flammable and they are very explosive if you allow them to become gases in the presence of an open flame. Also something else to watch out for is that organic molecules need to be worked with in a ventilated area. You cannot work in a tiny little cupboard here and hope to come out of there alive. Some of these things can be very toxic. Methanol, you've got to air it out because this stuff is not great for you if you breathe it in in large amounts. So we're not boiling big pots of this stuff and don't leave it out to evaporate. You'll notice that I've put the stopper back on this stuff so that we're not all getting woozy in the studio here. Okay, so I've used hot water to boil an alcohol and that was one of the safe ways that we could find out the boiling point of an organic material. What do you say, Ty? Well, that is very awesome. I was wondering, um, is there sugar and some tea bags there? Because I'd love some tea right now. <laughs> <laughs> On a serious note, guys, safety, safety, safety. If you are doing any of these experiments, make sure you guys are careful. Be very careful because all the stuff is very dangerous and we don't want to mess up your pretty faces, you know, that, you know, we know we need those for those Facebook profile pictures, you know. So guys, again, keep chatting to me, keep speaking to me on the Facebook page and guys, make sure you get in those questions. I'm seeing a lot of you answering those ch the challenge question and guys, I'm loving it. Keep bringing it in, bringing it 
in, bring it in, bring in more questions, more questions, more. Guys, keep asking. And right now, guys, I'm going to hand you back to Phil. Now that he's out of his, his, his mad scientist suit, we're going to get back <laughs> to this. <laughs> okay, well, always a mad scientist with or without the lab coat. <laughs> Okay, but what we're going to do is we're now going to investigate what just happened here. I took methanol, which is an alcohol, and I boiled the stuff. I took a liquid, I made it into a gas, the stuff was escaping. I'm going to figure out what intermolecular forces are at play there. As I said earlier, there's always Van der Waals forces. But this guy, hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is going to be very, very important when you start taking a look at alcohols and things which contain oxygen. Now, here's the thing. Now, if I start to talk about these types of intermolecular forces, I call them hydrogen bonding. Well, hydrogen bonds occur when I've got OH or NH inside a molecule. So an H bond or a hydrogen bond can only be found when I've got a molecule which has got OH, so that's an alcohol. Now, this one you might not know, or an NH. Now, these are amines and amides. But the reason that I talk to you about those is because OH and NH are actually the glue that stick you together. The reason that DNA is coiled in that really weird shape, the reason that some people have straight hair or that have curly hair, the reason for this is because of OH and NH actually sticking together. The really weird thing is you can walk up to your mother in the morning if she's dealing with a hairdryer or she's straightening out her hair or if she's doing anything with her hair, she's messing around with hydrogen bonds between OH and NH. Really fantastic. I can see that this works into every part of my life. Okay, well, the problem is I can't predict yet how these affect my boiling point. Well, it makes sense. If I've got more OH and I've got more NH, I'm going to have more chances for hydrogen bonding. So if I've got more of these guys, OH or NH, so in other words, if I've got more alcohols or if I've got more amines or amides, I'm going to have more hydrogen bonding. And that means that I can stick them together in a better way. Something else which affects them as well is where I find my NH or my OH. If it's close to the end of the chain, and now this is a big clue for our challenge question, if I find OH at the end of a chain, I find that it's better for the forces. I find that there's more forces, stronger forces. It's going to be difficult to pull them apart. I'm going to need something a lot more than hot water to pull these things apart if there's lots of OH and NH. Okay, once again, I'm going to work you through an example. Hopefully this ties up the last little bit about alcohols and gets you to answer that challenge question. And we're going to get to that in a moment. Okay, so let's take a look at our last example before we get in there. We're going to compare three molecules again. And this is starting to look a lot like your challenge question. I want to know out of these three molecules, I've got butan 1-ol, butan 2-ol, and butan 1,4-diol. I'm going to point out some really amazing stuff here. I've got my four carbons. Now, this all seems like there's just carbons and hydrogens everywhere. Now, I want you to practice your drawing. I want you to work with me. These guys are not scary if you're looking at intermolecular forces. We're going to circle something which is of interest. Now, all three of these are roughly the same size. So Van der Waals will be roughly the same size. Now, it's not Van der Waals force which is deciding the boiling points. If I take a look at butan 1 ol there's something interesting here. I've got an OH. And remember what I said? An OH is the thing which gets me hydrogen bonding. What about butan 2 ol I find that my OH is now hiding somewhere along the chain. I find that it's inside my molecule. It's hidden away from the outside world. Butan 1,4-diol, well, this guy's lucky. He's got two hydroxyls. He's got two ways to speak to the world around him. He's got two ways to reach out and touch another molecule and grab on tight. So I'm hoping that you can actually see that there is a difference between these in the way that they interact. The more of these OHs that something has, the better it's going to hydrogen bond and the higher the boiling and the melting point will be. Now, these particular bonds are the reason that you find many thick substances. You'll find substances like these, like in sugar and syrup, one of the things that finds sugar and syrup being so thick, very viscous, is strong intermolecular forces. Now, something which we haven't touched on yet is vapor pressure. Now, vapor pressure is very closely linked to our boiling point. And if something has a very high vapor pressure, it means that it has a strong desire to become a gas. 
that means that it has a very low boiling point. So let's take a look at these boiling points and you're going to tell me which one has got high or low vapor pressures. Well, let's bring them up. Now if I take a look at butane one ol, I've got a boiling point of 118 degrees Celsius. Okay, that's hotter than boiling water. I could not do my same experiment on this guy. What about this guy with the OH which is buried deep inside the molecule? This OH is hiding away. So it can't really do its job that well. So what we find is that my boiling point decreases when I put my OH in the middle of the chain. It's hidden away. It doesn't hydrogen bond very well. What about this guy right down at the bottom? He can do it twice as well as anybody else. If I've got OH and I've got OH once again, I'm going to find that my boiling point is massive. This stuff is amazing and it boils at a very, very high temperature. 230 degrees, uh, sorry, 235 degrees Celsius. Okay, that's way hotter than anything we can make here in the lab, right? And this is something that I really don't want you to try at home. But the, now these chemicals are boiling at different temperatures. What does this mean? Let's give this a little bit of a title. Let's work through this. Remember that these were boiling points. I find that my OH, where it is, how many there are, is actually deciding my boiling point. I've got one at the end that's getting me a high boiling point. If it's not at the end, slightly lower. What if there's two? Well, this means that this guy has got twice the ability to make hydrogen bonds. And that's going to get me a massive boiling point of 235. Can you guess which one of these has got the highest vapor pressure? Now, remember that vapor pressure was the ability to turn into a gas. This is our guy. This guy has got a very low boiling point in comparison with the other ones. This means that this guy has got the most desire to become a gas. I hope that that explains what vapor pressure is. Very, very difficult to grasp something, especially because they're such technical words. Vapor pressure is something's desire to escape and become a gas. Okay, Ty, how's that Facebook page looking? Facebook page is blowing up. Guys, keep sending in those messages. Keep, keep asking, keep asking. Um, right now, we don't have any questions as of yet. Okay. But a lot of people are, are dying to find out the answer for the challenge question. Oh, very we'll nice. get to that at the end of the show, guys. So, Phil, do you want to explain any more? Absolutely. Well, what I'm going to start doing is I'm going to give you a little bit of a clue as to that challenge question. After the break, we're actually going to work our way through the challenge question and decide why one boils higher than the other. And we're going to make... Uh, all of this come into perspective. Now this section, if you do it right, it's going to make a lot of sense. You're going to walk into your exam, beautiful marks, get full marks. So I've taken the idea that hydrogen bonding is more important than fun of vols. Now that's something which we didn't cover. Hydrogen bonding is king. If there is fun of vols forces and there's hydrogen bonding, hydrogen bonding is doing all the decision making. It's deciding when things boil. It says yes or no when this when deciding what our boiling point is going to be. I don't even worry about the fact that there are fun of forces yet. So I'm going to start taking a look at how this might relate to my challenge question. The position of OH tells me if there's going to be hydrogen bonding and how strong that hydrogen bonding will be. Well, I think it's around about time to take a little bit of an ad break. Okay. Yeah, definitely. So, guys, what we're going to do now is we're going to take a little bit of a break. Guys, I see you. I see you. Um, Sinalo, don't worry. I'm on it. I'll get that question answered for you. Guys, stay tuned. Remember, Facebook me. Tweet me. Let me know what you're thinking. If you are frustrated with anything, please let me know so I can pass it on to Phil so he can help you guys out. That's what the platform is there for. So, guys, again, facebook.com forward slash learn extra and tweet me at learn extra. See you soon after break. Welcome back, Mindsetters. It's Grade 12 Physical Science. I'm going to hand you straight back to Phil. Just want to send a quick shout out to Liberty for sponsoring the show, and Phil's going to take us away. Absolutely. Okay, Mindsetters, I've got something great to show you. What I've actually done is we've started taking a look at different molecules and how we can combine them and change their properties. Now, what I'm going to show you now is a clip of how we can actually take a carboxylic acid and we can take an alcohol and make an ester and what you'll actually find and this is a bit of a clue to the challenge question is that esters generally have a lower boiling point if I take an alcohol and a carboxylic acid and I combine it what I'm going to find is that an ester is going to come off at a lower boiling point and it's going to be the first to boil let's take a look at that clip let's get on those safety glasses and go to the lab
Hi everyone, welcome back to my lab. We're going to do some organic chemistry together using carboxylic acids. We're going to use ethanol and pentanoic acid to make something new. This is called a reflux apparatus. We heat the mixture in the bottom of the round bottom flask until it boils. The gases rise into the condenser where they become liquid again by condensation and fall back into the mixture. Refluxing allows us to keep the reaction hot and boiling without losing any of the liquids inside. So let's get going. First, we place some alcohol inside the flask. And some pentanoic acid. Finally, we add a few drops of sulfuric acid, being careful not to touch anything. This acts as a good catalyst for this reaction. Now, we heat up the mixture and let it boil and reflux for 10 minutes. Now, we must distill the mixture to separate the parts of the mixture. The ethanol boils off easily at 78 degrees. The mixture will boil over here, past the thermometer and into the condenser, where it will turn into a liquid and collect here. We'll continue to heat the mixture. Can you see the alcohol boiling off on this side? As we start to collect, the part which boils at around about 140 to 145 degrees, we start to see and smell a different product. Hmm, I wish I had smell-o-vision. This stuff smells great. It has a very sweet smell and reminds me a little of apples. This sweet smelling product from this reaction is called an ester. So let's get this straight. When a carboxylic acid like this reacts with an alcohol like this, we get an ester as a product. Hi there, welcome back. I hope that you learned a little bit something out of that queue. We were making those delicious smells inside the lab. I hope that you'll note that I was wearing all that safety equipment because all of those things are flammable. You didn't see any naked flames there. You didn't see any fire. I was using a hot plate to heat all of those things. I hope that you could see that my ester was coming off first. And what you'll find is that the alcohol and the acid, and here's the clue to today's challenge, is that the acid and the alcohol can hydrogen bond much more effectively. Well, let's find out what these boiling points are, put you out of your misery, and actually find out. I gave you a little bit of a hint. There was one boiling point a little bit earlier. Let's not bounce that around. There it is. All right, and that was the boiling point of propane 1,3-diol. Okay, well, let's bring up a couple of these other boiling points. I'm hoping that I can actually find them. Um, 
we're having a bit of a technical maladjustment there. But what I'm actually going to say to you is that these other boiling points are going to be slightly different. I've pointed out the highest boiling point. Let's take a look at one of these things and why they boil at different temperatures. Now, one of the things that I'm going to show you is something quite important. A lot of people have this mistake in their minds. If I've got an ester, I still have oxygen, I still have hydrogen, but this guy cannot hydrogen bond. There is no hydrogen bonding inside here. So, no hydrogen bonding, and uh, let's actually bring up its boiling point there. There we go. I find that no hydrogen bonding means that it's got a very, very low bonding ability. Now, a lot of you are asking on the Facebook page, how does this affect viscosity? Well, this guy has got very, very strong intermolecular forces. This means that this will be very viscous. So high intermolecular forces, very strong intermolecular forces, means that I've usually got a very high boiling point and I've got a high viscosity. Now, this particular one, I can see that there is hydrogen bonding. Molecule 1 and 3 are isomers of each other. But I'll actually find that this particular molecule boils at a much greater temperature than the ester. This one can hydrogen bond to a very, very great extent. Now, what I find is that my carboxylic acid over here, and I've lost the boiling point there, but what I can tell you is that 2 boils at the highest temperature. Then I'll find molecule 3, so that's 2, then 3, then 1. So let's figure out which one of those options it was. Option C offers me that option. There it is. If I take option C here, let's draw it in here, let's circle it for the viewers at home. Option C, if you chose that one, that was absolutely correct. I actually find that my boiling points go from my highest all the way down to my lowest, and there it is. I've got molecule 2, then 3, then 1. A lot of you are asking questions about these. I'm going to go to Ty and ask some of those. Yes. So guys, keep those questions coming in. Right now I'm going to ask one of these questions. Ashley wanted to find out, how do you get the boiling points? Is it possible to get, do it mathematically? Okay, really, really nice question. Okay, this is always the thing in, thing in science. When there are numbers, people want to reach for formulas. They want to calculate things. Now, these boiling points are unbelievably difficult to predict. We can just say higher or lower. Now, these numbers are not reached by calculation. These have actually got to go and measure. Just the same way that I did earlier on in the lab, what we did was we actually watched the material boiling past that thermometer, and when it was boiling, it reached a stable temperature, when it was turning into the gas. We could only find this by measurement. If I take my boiling point, it's got to be measured. It very seldom can be calculated, and you need a very, very strong computer to be able to predict the exact boiling point, and even then, they sometimes get it wrong. Hope that answers that question. Definitely. Um, next, I'm looking at some of these questions. Awesome, awesome stuff, guys. Again, keep sending in questions, keep sending. Guys, don't be afraid to help each other out on the page as well. And next, we've got, um, let me see, let me see, let me see. Hmm, nothing so far yet, but we will, we will be on it. So Phil, I don't know if you want to explain a couple a more. Absolutely. What I'm going to do is I'm going to get into the nitty gritty of this reaction. Now, when I talk to you about the alcohol, when I talk to you about my propanoic acid is the bottom one, if you want to name these things, and then I've got propan diol. Now, these guys are very, very similar to each other. The question is, why is this one so special? Now, we're going to take a look at something which these molecules have got, which is very important. Okay, so let's actually take a look here. Let's circle the things which are actually making the boiling point so high. And I can see a couple there. I've got OH and I've got another OH over there. If I've got two hydroxyl groups, if I've got double alcohol, that means that I've got two ways in which I can grab onto the next molecule. Now, please, please, please don't use this language when you're talking about these molecules boiling or if they're melting or if they're talking about the viscosity or anything of that matter. When you're heating something up, you are not breaking bonds. Okay, you are loosening forces of attraction. Now, that is the misconception. I'm not breaking a single bond. When I boil this molecule, this molecule will look exactly the same. I will still have the oxygens and the hydrogens and the carbons all stuck in one. They're not going anywhere. 
Looks like Tao wants to talk to me about something. Definitely. We have a question from Kashifa. She's dying to find out if triple bonds have higher boiling points than single bonds. Okay, very, very good question. Okay, now the problem is in this idea of bonding. Now I'm going to draw a particular molecule and I want you to follow through with me. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a molecule of propine and I'm going to do a molecule of propane. And I want you to try to draw it with me and I'm going to show you which one is the higher boiling point. So if I wanted to predict what's going on here, let's actually draw out our molecules and that's always a good step when we're talking about organic chemistry. So I'm going to start off with propane. There it is. I'm actually going to find that propane. There we go. Okay, propane. Now this is actually quite a tricky question by Kashifa is you can actually figure out the difference in boiling points behind these. Now propane has got a very, very, very low boiling point. What you'll find is that it's in the negative degrees. As a result, this stuff is actually a gas. Now the gas which I was actually using, and I'm actually going to go grab it quickly, this stuff over here, this is actually propane. Now what they've done is they've taken propane and butane and they've mixed it inside here. And on the front here, I can actually read, I don't know if it's a little bit too small, there's butane and there's propane which is mixed inside here. This together, when we squeeze it, becomes liquid petroleum gas. And that's that liquid sound when we shake one of these. Now, it's the same mixture when you find those camping gas canisters. I've got propane which is actually a gas. And if I open this up, the gas is released. Okay, so let's put that away for the moment. Now, the question Kashifa asks is, what happens if I don't have a single bond? Well. Let's try a double or even a triple bond like she said. So if I've got a triple bond, here we go. There it is. Propine. Now, this is quite a tricky one. What you'll notice is that there's a lot of hydrogen which is missing. Now, it's not down to the molecule size. This one has got approximately the same size as propine. Now, something else comes into play here. Now, this is something a little bit beyond the realms of grade 12 chemistry but what you'll actually find is that electrons really like hanging around inside these bonds. I will actually find that there's a portion of this molecule which is quite negative because of all that bonding going on there. There's a lot of electrons between these carbons. I suspect that this molecule because it's not nice and symmetrical this way I can find that if I divide up my molecule over here it's one nice big blob and it's the same the whole way around. This means that this relies only on London or temporary dipole forces. However, this guy is not so balanced. What we'll find is that electrons are hanging around on one side of my molecule. And what you'll find is that that is going to give it a tendency to make a dipole-dipole moment. We'll probably find that my propine has got a slightly higher boiling point. Very good question. Yes, I've got another one here from Mahangani. Again, sorry if I didn't get your name right. I'm, I'm trying my best. <laughs> she wanted to find out what is the fun what's the effect of functional groups on viscosity on organic molecules? Oh, very, very nice question. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a couple of examples on how that actually affects it. I'm going to use the example which I did earlier. Now, what types of functional groups? What are functional groups? So I'm going to give you an example of what a functional group is and we're going to see how that affects the viscosity. So I'm going to take a look at a very simple organic molecule. I'm going to give you some chloromethane. Now I'm going to talk to you about a very similar molecule except it's the one which I boiled earlier. I'm going to talk to you about methanol. Okay, and there it is. The only difference between these two is what the functional group is. And let's actually circle that functional group. I've got a functional group over there. There it is. It's a chloro functional group. This is a halo alkane because I've got a halogen on an alkane. Okay, well, what happens if I've got a hydroxy alkane? In other words, an alcohol. If I have a hydroxy functional group, let's circle it there. What is the difference? Okay, well, chlorine doesn't do anything special for me. What you'll find is that chlorine likes to have a few electrons to itself, but what you'll find is that this molecule is actually a gas. That means that it cannot be viscous. It's very, very thin. You know that gas is not viscous. I know this because I can breathe it through my nose, I can breathe it into my lungs. It cannot be viscous. What about this stuff? I saw that this was a liquid. If you go from a gas to a liquid, you increase the viscosity many times. And viscosity is something which you usually only talk about in liquids. 
So I'm going to do one more liquid and I'm going to show you how those functional groups actually change the viscosity here. And the liquid which I'm going to choose is one which you put inside your car's engine. Now this one is called ethane 1, 2 diol. I've got two OHs where I had one and what I'm actually going to find is that this material is very very viscous. If you pick up a bottle of antifreeze please be very careful it's very toxic but this stuff looks a lot like syrup or honey. It's very high viscosity, lots of OH. I think that's all we have time for though Ty. Yeah definitely. Phil, so guys out there thanks again for, for posting your questions and asking us again the platform is for you and Phil if you could just do a recap for us so guys can just know everything that you guys that you went through today. Absolutely. Okay, now very, very easy. Now if you're faced with a question of how are the following properties governed, I want you to start thinking about intermolecular forces. Is it van der Waals? Is it hydrogen? Just remember that hydrogen is much stronger than van der Waals and that van der Waals is governed by the molecular size. That's about it. Awesome. So guys, quick shout out to Liberty for sponsoring the show. And again, guys, keep posting, keep talking to each other. Use the platform. It is for you guys. And for, for today, that's it. So guys, tune in tomorrow again for, the, for more lessons. See you soon.